Casual Birder Podcast, a weekly podcast for people interested in wild birds. I'm Susie Buttress. This week we hear from the RSPB's Jamie Wyver about why we should make room for swifts. The common swift is an African bird that comes to the UK for a few months in the summer to breed. Though they're found in both town and countryside, it's possible that many people don't even notice them. They are high-flying insect eaters, spending nearly all their time on the wing, even when sleeping. Swifts are fascinating birds, with their scythe-like wings and deeply forked tails. They are the fastest flying bird in level flight, and their screeching calls fill the air on sunny summer days. But they are in decline. Swifts have been placed on the amber list of birds of conservation concern. Suitable nesting sites have disappeared in recent times, and this is having a big impact on swift numbers. During February 2019, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the RSPB, is running a campaign to encourage people to put up nest boxes for swifts on their homes. I spoke to Jamie Wyver of the RSPB to find out more about why this campaign is necessary. Hi Jamie, thank you so much for joining me again on the Casual Birder podcast. I understand you've got news to share about swifts. Yes, that's right. Swifts are in big trouble in the UK, um, but we are having a bit of a drive this month, this February, to try and get as many new homes put up for them as possible. And can you tell us a little bit about what a swift is like, what kind of bird it is? It's the most extraordinary bird. It's unlike anything else that we have in the UK. It's almost alien. In a way, it's a very familiar bird, very familiar sound um, for a few weeks every year. We could say it was the quintessential urban bird, uh, literally sharing our houses, um, church spires, other historic buildings. Each summer, swifts fly from Africa to the UK to nest and to raise their chicks. Um, And over the course of that um, incredible 6,000 mile epic journey, they never touch the ground once. They spend their entire lives on the wing, eating, sleeping, drinking, bathing in raindrops, mating, never touching the ground at all. They're also our fastest bird in level flight. The top recorded speed is 69.3 miles an hour. And that's beaten only by the incredible stoop of the peregrine when it's catching its prey. That's amazing. That's really incredible. You mentioned that they they never stop uh, apart from to nest. So how do they build their nests? What, what, what is it that they do? Swift nests are incredibly basic. It, this is a, uh, a bird that nests in cracks and crevices. And going back uh, a few thousand years, they would have uh, been found nesting in caves, in cliffs, and also in very ancient trees. And there are still a few trees in the UK um, on our Abernethy Nature Reserve in Scotland, where you do actually still get tree nesting swifts. But what's happened over the uh, in recent history, I suppose, of, of human colonisation of land is that they've learned to live with us. They've learned to that our buildings often have uh, cracks and holes in around the roofs. And that's where they go. That's where they go into nest. And a swift nest really is just a hole. Swift flies in. There might be a few feathers, um, but there's no nesting material as such. Um, they literally just have a, a tiny little space inside a small gap. They'll lay their eggs there. And when they leave, they leave no mess whatsoever. You said that the RSPB are looking to help swifts by creating more locations for the nest. Just to put this into context, um, we are losing our swifts at an incredible rate. Um, Lost about half of them in the last 20 years or so. And uh, we know that one of the problems that they face is lack of those nesting sites. Our modern homes just don't have those little nooks and crannies in anymore. So there are two quite easy options that people can go for if they want to help give swifts a home. And one of them is a swift brick. And that is um, particularly good if you are having renovations or a new build property. Um, It fits neatly inside your wall cavity. So there's nothing sticking out of the exterior wall. Just a hole, the bird flies in. It's got a nice little little brick, swift brick inside. And that's made by a company called Manthorpe. But the RSPB has also produced a new swift nest box. And what's lovely about this is it's been developed working closely with swift experts. There's a a bit of a sloping roof. So any rainwater that does come down and uh, gets around the eaves and drips onto it they that rolls off but there's also a little um a nest cup inside and that makes it easier for them to put their eggs in one place and sit on them without the eggs sort of rolling around inside the nest box and that's now uh, available on our website for sale um quick and easy way to get to it is rspbshop 
swiftbox.co.uk slash swiftbox. And you can see exactly what they look like on there. And we would love to try and get at least a thousand new homes up for Swifts this spring by the time that they arrive late April, early May. That would be amazing. So whereabouts on a, on a property would you place it? Does it have to be on like the highest point? They need to be at least five metres up, um, obviously out of the uh, prevailing wind, um, not too uh, shaded. They need a little bit of warmth, but obviously not too much in the sun. So just figure out which part of your building is, is the best. Positioning them, you will need a long ladder or a window cleaner or someone local who can come and put them up for you. And the other thing I would say is that Swifts are colony nesters. So if you can put up two or three, even better. And uh, one tip is to uh, play Swift screaming calls out of your window when you when you spot Swifts around. Don't just sort of sit by your window all day. But if you if you happen to be sat at home and you think, oh, there's some Swifts swooping around, they've just come back from migration. Let's blast a bit of Swift calls out the window um, and see if that will draw them in, because that will convince them that this is a good place to nest. Is that ethical? It is, actually. I mean, often with birding, we say that... Um, you shouldn't be luring birds over just so you can see or photograph them. Um, and that's particularly, you know, in breeding season or when the, when birds are just trying to find food or as they're young. But actually, when you are trying to um, show them somewhere to nest, that is actually quite a good thing to do. It's a little bit of conservation there. And if you think about it, we do it with other rare birds, putting, putting out decoys to attract them to nesting areas. It's just showing the bird that this, this is a really good, safe place for you to come and nest. And the other thing I would say is that they might not nest straight away. So don't be disappointed if a swift doesn't move in straight away. Like all birds, they take time to get used to things and, and to settle in. So and this is an investment. This is something you're putting up on your building um, where swifts will find a home. Might not be in the first year. It could be a couple of years down the line, but it will be there and it'll be ready for them. And we will help build up this huge number of new nest holes for these birds. That's amazing. So you said that there's a campaign running during February to publicise yep. this uh, with people. If people buy boxes, is there some way they can let you know that they've got one just so that you can kind of keep track of the numbers that are being put up? They can certainly let us know on social media. Clearly, we'll be able to keep an eye on the ones we sell from our own website. There's also um, an activity on our Giving Nature a Home section of our website where I believe there are instructions to make your own. Um, and again, people can log that they've done that on there. So there's various ways we can keep an eye on it. But we'd love to see people's photos of their Swift boxes up in place if they tweet us at uh, Nature's Voice on Twitter, for example. Oh, yeah, that would be a wonderful way to do it. Val, you mentioned that the Swifts would be coming back soon from, is it Africa that they spend the winter in it is and, and actually relatively little is known about the um what what swifts do outside of um of, of their time here because they, they are only here for 12 weeks or so and it's a bit so it's a bit of a mystery as to exactly where they go they could cover probably do cover a vast area um and then when we finally see them back here and um, generally the first arrival dates tend to be last week of april the first week of may um they'll then be here for say about 12 weeks or so and then they'll disappear again for the rest of the year we don't really know um definitely more science needs to be done more tracking needs to be done to see exactly what areas these birds are using but we do know that in the uk there is this massive decline and the one thing that we can clearly identify is that loss of nesting spaces is it purely that houses are they're all built so well nowadays that there aren't the cracks there aren't the spaces in them for the nests we want to make our houses environmentally friendly. We want our houses to, to 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 store heat. We don't want them to be letting out, you know, heat through through gaps in the roof or letting in water. So modern houses, it's it's very sensible to have an environmentally friendly, sustainable building. Um, but obviously, the Swift, which has now um, developed this need to live alongside us, is going to miss out if we do that. So with these extra simple little additions, we can keep our house modern and clean and environmentally friendly, and you know, storing heat and etc. But we can give the Swift a little a little bit of a fighting chance as well. Is there anything else that we should be thinking of for those people that don't have tall buildings or don't have buildings that are suitable for swift boxes? Is there anything else that we can do to help swifts? Yes, of course. So a little bit nearer to the time when they come back, there is a swift survey on our website and that is to identify where they're actually nesting. So we ask people to listen out to where the birds are um, screaming, that, that distinctive noise that they make flying around at uh, roof height, or also where they actually see them physically nesting. By recording where swifts are nesting, we can build up a bit of a national picture. And the resource that that then builds up is something that can be used by local planners and ecologists in councils so that when they are new buildings proposed or refurbishments, demolitions, 
a local planner or ecologist can look at that and say, ah, well, this is an area where we know we've got swift nesting. So if that building goes, then we need to, you know, add some new homes on this building or this is a particularly good area for swift. So if you're a, a new build developer coming to build a new housing estate, we would stipulate that you add swift bricks to your building. So the swift survey is building up this big national picture of where swifts need to go. More from Jamie later. As Jamie said, the common swift is a summer visitor to the UK, coming here to breed, and they can be found everywhere except in the furthest northwest of Scotland. They are only here for around 12 weeks, and that's a short stay when you realise that they've flown thousands of kilometres to get here from Africa. They are not a flashy bird. Their plumage is predominantly dark brown, with a white chin, although that's hard to see in flight. A little smaller than a starling, but with a wingspan around three times the length of its body, sometimes fluttering its wings, at other times soaring and gliding. They fly in flocks, wheeling around in the air and calling, which sounds like high-pitched screeching. That might be the thing to draw your attention upwards, to see where the noise is coming from. They often fly so high that they're like dots in the bright summer sky, but the sound of their call still reaches us on the ground. According to the British Trust for Ornithology, the collective noun for swifts is a scream. They are famed for never landing and doing everything on the wing, even sleeping and mating. Their diet consists of airborne insects that they catch while flying, and they drink raindrops or skim water from ponds and lakes, as you might have seen swallows do. While they might look like swallows, another summer visitor, Their closest relatives are the other swifts and hummingbirds. And their behaviour is quite different. You'll never see a group of swifts sitting on a power line singing and chattering, as you might with the swallows. According to the RSPB's fact sheet on swifts, the four toes on a swift's foot are arranged in twos and point sideways like a chameleon's toes, rather than the three forward and one backwards like the perching birds. For many people, they are a herald of summer. Julian Jackson, who walked from Land's End to John O'Groats last year for the Big Blind Walk, told me in episode 26 how much he anticipated the return of the Swifts each year. And, and of course, for me, the biggest sound of all is the Swift. Uh, I think that's probably the same for everybody, but that really heralds the spring for me. And when I lived in London, I used to write it in a diary and the Swifts would come back almost to the day. It was around the 5th of May that they oh, wow. would, would come wheeling over the house. It was, it was extraordinary. We had a meadow just sitting behind the house, which was one of the best kept secrets in London. It was a two <laughs> acre, two acre meadow, um, communal gardens for houses that were around there, only about 15 houses around it. And uh, we used to manage it, maintain it, um, keep it quite wild, some of it. And of course, lots of bugs and things would float up and um, swifts would catch them. It won't be long before the swifts return. If you're able, put up a swift nest box or two. If that isn't possible, join the RSPB's swift survey and help record the birds that you see and hear. And when they arrive, I'll remind you to take a moment to marvel at this bird and the journey it makes each year. Links to the RSPB shop and further information on swifts can be found in the show notes. This year marks the 130th anniversary of the RSPB. Last year, when I spoke to Jamie about the Big Garden Bird Watch, I asked him about his work with the RSPB. Here is his never-before-released interview. You've been birding them most of your life, yeah. and uh, you managed to get a job here at the RSPB. Dream job. <laughs> so how did that come about? It's quite tough getting into conservation, and um, often what you have to do is start off volunteering um, it's, a, it's a very familiar story to, to many of your listeners, I imagine. Um, I volunteered for about five years at London Wetland Centre, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, um, as a greeter and a tour guide and a, and a bat walk guide uh, in the evenings, and eventually got a job there working in marketing. Worked there for a few years, uh, decided that I wanted to get a bit more in, in depth knowledge, so I did a Master's in Conservation Science at Imperial, um, and then thought, I don't really want to do any more PR or marketing, looked around for jobs and. <laughs> found a PR job here and ended up coming to the RSPB. But actually working for the RSPB has been amazing. Could you tell me a little bit about um, the RSPB as an organisation and what its aims are? 
So the RSPB has been around a while, um, started off initially as a campaign um, led by women to uh, stop birds' feathers being used in hats because um, it was decimating populations of certain egret species, great crested grebes, etc. Very successful campaign. No more hats with big feathers in, uh, taken from the wild. Um, and then it built from that, really, and has campaigned and bought land to preserve for nature over the years. And we're now at a very interesting point where the organisation is very large. We've recognised that we're not just about birds because, the, you know, the wildlife that uses the land that we own is quite rich and quite varied. And birds don't exist in a vacuum. They need places to you know, roost and things to eat. Um, so we look after a variety of wildlife. We have over 200 nature reserves in the UK. The majority are open to the public. Um, some aren't for very specific reasons about, you know, protecting what's what's actually there. But... The range of habitats we look after is is fascinating and huge. And um, I know that one of the ambitions of the RSPB is to, is to increase this even more. It, to um, achieve a, a world rich in nature, we know that a, quite a large proportion of land and sea is going to have to be devoted to conserving wildlife. So we've taken on a, quite a lot of interesting new reserves in the past few years. One that fascinated me was Wallasey Island in Essex, which was um, former agricultural land. It was a, it's a piece of land, uh, kind of an island, um, which is threatened by sea level rise. So in the future, it wouldn't be great for agriculture anyway. We've reclaimed it. We're turning it into this amazing new space, new wetland nature reserve, um, helped by Crossrail, who provided a lot of the spoil, the material they dug up when they were digging the Crossrail tunnels in London, which was all put on barges and taken up there to landscape this reserve. Um, and that is a really interesting one because, as well as it's going to, you know, it'll be a great day out to go and walk around. But when it's finished, um, you, we may well get species like black winged stilt, like spoonbill coming over. And this is part of preparing for the future, preparing for changes in climate. We know that a lot of these birds are moving up from Europe as the marshlands that they rely on are drying out. And we did get several uh, nests and uh, nesting attempts by black winged stilts last year. Some were quite successful. In fact, I went to see some at Ooze Washes. I'm just seeing if, um, if I made a note of that somewhere. Yeah, so there were six pairs of black winged stilts in the UK. Um, and half of them were on RSPB reserves, and three uh, pairs successfully raised nine young. And that's the highest count of fledged stilts um, probably since 1983. So beautiful little elegant bird, a bit like an avocet. Um, so we have this kind of I idea that we are not just preserving land, keeping it as it is, but we are creating space where wild which wildlife is going to need in the future. And Wallace Island is a really good example of that. That's amazing. I hadn't thought about that kind of thing. You know, I know that we've been seeing over the last few years, uh, well, we've had spoonbills down in St Ives in that area and um, egrets, we see a lot of them now. Yeah. And maybe 20 years ago, it'd be a really rare thing to see. But actually, uh, my parents live in Essex and when we've been over there, we very often see them on the estuary sort of areas. Um, and I guess they're move, moving further north now as well in the UK. Yeah, and I remember when you used to see egrets from the train going through Dawlish in the southwest. Yes. And you used to get quite excited, but now they're everywhere, these little egrets. Um, our Ham Wall Reserve in the southwest, um, we now sort of jokingly refer to it as the National Heron Collection because we've now got about six heron species nesting, oh, really? there possibly seven. So with things like cattle egret coming over, great white egret, um, what else? Possibly night heron, um, spoonbills, bittern, little bittern they've had there. So all these species are wetlands birds um, and they are literally being pushed up north by the So they a would normally, climate. a lot of those would normally be found in what, southern, southern France Europe, yeah. and southern Spain. And yeah, so that they are moving with, with the climate. Um, the other thing that we are seeing is birds at the other end of the UK being pushed upwards because things like uh, puffins and kittiwakes are suffering because the sand deals that they need to eat they're moving further north because their food is moving further north as the, as the sea warms so you're seeing this huge shift in bird species with new things arriving but worryingly we're, the, we're then losing birds at the top of the uk if you kind of picture it that way yeah um that have probably nowhere to go no once i was just going to say that yeah um so you 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 could get situations where you've got kitty wakes and puffins having to fly further and further out to sea to hunt for fish to bring back for their young which is going to get become a real problem so a lot of what we're doing is, is future planning. The RSPB is unique in that we are, because we're such a big organisation with lots of different components, we can track a conservation problem by, first of all, we can 
identify it we can have our scientists and we've got a fantastic you know team of about 50 university grade scientists a proper serious science department that will identify a problem they'll kind of work out what's going on see what's going on we can then pass that to our conservation team who will say this is what we need to do these are the projects we need we can fundraise for the project we can then recruit people to manage the project we can run the project we can promote the project and you know we can take a story all the way through from the beginning to the end um and part of that is working very closely with partners so one of the successes um in recent years has been the cell bunting in the southwest this is a very tiny little bird related to yellow hammers and um it was vanishing basically um we've worked with farmers and landowners um natural england and other partners to kind of bring them back and um we bought a piece of land at Labrador Bay where you can actually go and see these birds all year round. We had seven pairs to start with and now got 29. I've recently bought a new piece of land as well nearby. So that bird has kind of bounced back thanks to that kind of whole planning process and working with, with local farmers. So expect to see a lot more of that kind of thing in the future. Conservation collaboration is going to be the way forward. There's a huge project called Back from the Brink. And some of those projects as part of Back from the Brink are bird focused. So willow tit, for example, a, a species which, you know, the range is contracted, the numbers have gone down. We're now kind of trying to work on building the right habitat for these little birds to come back. Um, so it is really, really important to work with other experts and, and other teams and government departments and, and also um, BirdLife International Partners. We are the UK BirdLife uh, partner uh, in America, they've got Alderbon. In many, perhaps other countries that your listeners are in, there'll be a, a bird life representative. So, particularly when you're working with a migratory bird, turtle dove, for example, whole teams of people in different countries are all now talking to each other, trying to track where this bird's going, what it needs, what we need to lobby to protect on its on its migration route. Um, so, the size and scale of what we do is massive. And one final thing that I didn't realise before I worked here was that. We work internationally. We, we don't just work in the UK. We work across all the UK overseas territories. So you think talking things about things like the Falklands Islands, Henderson, Gough, Pitcairn, Gough Island in particular. Expect to see this in the news soon. It's a tiny little island off Tristan de Kuna, uh, a, a UK overseas territory where um, ground nesting seabirds are being decimated by uh, house mice, which have found their way there through human oh, boats and human yeah. travel. So there's a huge project planned to try and get the mice off the island so these birds' populations can recover because one of them, at least I think, is critically endangered. So lots of work we're doing all around the world. We actually um, manage um, a rainforest in Gola, um, manage Harapan in Indonesia. Uh, we work on vulture release projects in India. So the, the, the scale of what we do is absolutely huge. So from, from big garden bird watch, watching birds in your garden to, you know, one of the remote, most remote islands on, on the planet, we, the RSPB is there trying to save birds. That's amazing. I had no idea that your reach was so, so far. That's really fascinating to hear. Where can people find out more about um, the RSPB? Because it is a, is it a charity or is it? Yeah. Yes, it's a charity. Um, there's a few places. Um, look for Nature's Voice on Twitter look for rspb love nature on facebook and then the old traditional website rspb.org.uk and uh, as we've said there's lots of information on there about the birds you might see how you might attract them to your garden our big campaign over the last few years giving nature a home has all been about what you plant in your garden what you can create in your garden um, making ponds compost seats we've got so much information on the website well thank you so much jamie for your time it's been fascinating talking to you thank you for more information about the SWIFT and about the work of the RSPB, visit rspb.org. And keep an eye out during February for guest blog posts on the RSPB website and on the RSPB's Twitter feed at nature's underscore voice. I love to hear about the birds you're seeing. Kate from Strange Animals Podcast sent me this recording of Sandhill Cranes. She said, I got this audio at the Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge in Alabama on December the 28th. It's a cacophony of sandhill cranes calling, along with some other birds I can't identify. 
I wish I'd thought to get audio of a few cranes flying over because they make pretty trilling calls while they fly. You can kind of hear the trilling in this audio clip at times, but it's buried in the overall noise. There were thousands of sandhill cranes at the refuge and probably hundreds of ducks and other waterfowl, if not thousands. Most of the area is closed off during the winter so the birds aren't disturbed, which is understandable but frustrating since almost all the ducks were just too far away to positively ID. We did see some northern shovelers, a few lesser scorps, a pied-billed grebe, mallards, great egrets and great blue herons, as well as the sandhill cranes. We also saw four whooping cranes, or maybe the same two twice, which was more exciting than anything else. There are only around 800 whooping cranes alive in the world, and very few of them migrate to the southeastern United States. That's amazing, Kate. Thanks so much for sending that in and for all that information about the bird species you saw. On Twitter, at NRI underscore woman, from the NRI Woman podcast, posted a lovely photograph of a brown pelican seen on a walk in Miami, Florida. I hope to see some more photos of the birds that they see. Susan from Dead Ladies Show told me that seeing buzzards sailing in the thermals was a favourite sighting of hers. And from the Facebook group, Adrian told me Thursday was bird day. I'm currently working on burning tonnes of fallen trees brought down by a Christmas windstorm. From Vancouver Island told me Thursday was bird day. I'm currently working on burning tonnes of fallen trees brought down by a Christmas windstorm. A break in the snow and a partial clearing meant the various piles of wood and some ground were exposed. The area was just heaving with sparrows, chickadees and towies, picking through everything to see what was on offer. I also had a raven fly over me with a whole rat in its mouth, which is unusual. They normally eat larger food where they find it, only carrying away smaller bits. He also said, to add to your Corvid show, that was my last week's episode, The best way to spot a raven is to hear them. I haven't figured out the mechanics of it, but even when they're staying silent, you can hear a raven's wings as they fly over. It's not a flapping sound, it's almost like a creaking noise. And when it's quiet, you can hear it from about 75 foot below them. Thanks so much for that, Adrian. I really appreciate your insight into the birds you see. I know you work really closely with nature and you have some amazing observations. And I can now add Sparrowhawk to my garden list for 2019 after a sudden flurry of activity that I saw this weekend. I was making lunch and I happened to look out the window and see a female Sparrowhawk dive into the top of our mock orange shrub. She reappeared back the way she came and then dived into the front of the shrub, came out and dived in again at the side. She came out empty taloned and flew off. But I've never seen one do that before. Normally they swoop in and grab whatever they're going for. Clearly she was chasing a bird in the bush. Judging from the speed of her diving in and out of the shrub, she was clearly on the verge of catching something and it was a pretty intense couple of seconds. But now my garden list stands at 21 species for the year. And is anyone else keeping a year list for their garden? Do let me know how 2019 is turning out for you. Join our Facebook group to discuss this week's episode. I'll post your photos of the birds you've seen. I really do enjoy hearing your tales, so come and join the conversation there. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at casual birder pod or on Instagram at casual birder podcast. And you can email me at casual pod at gmail.com. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing to the show. Subscribing is free and you can do it wherever you listen. And if you enjoy the show, please consider posting about it on social media. Personal recommendation is such a valuable way of helping others to find the show. I love hearing what you have to say about the shows, so let me know that you've listened. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at www.dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast.